morning. Let's pray. Lord, we uh, pray for your blessing on this word. It's your word written so long ago, but speaking as vitally now as ever. So we, we do pray for your presence, uh, continued presence with us here this morning in the hearing of your word. In Christ's name, amen. Don't you hate it when people cut in line? Have you ever? I'm sure you have. I'm not even going to ask. But do you remember last time you were in a traffic jam when it when, went down from two lanes to one or three to two, and you get over obediently in your lane, and you know you see this sign, this is one mile, and the lane disappears, and you're put- putting along, bumper to bumper, moving along ever so slowly, even though you have to be somewhere, and you're just chugging along bumper to bumper, and all of a sudden, on your left, there's a guy who comes steaming down the road, and uh, what's, he, what's he wanting to do? He wants to cut in at the last minute, right? And hey, have you been in that situation? Yes, we've been. And, and you kind of watch, and part of you says, no, don't, don't, don't let him in. Don't, don't do it. You know, let him in, you know, and you get upset about it. And uh, why, why is that? I'm losing control here. Why is that? Well, uh, you know, people hate, hate it when you cut in line. And I know this for a fact because uh, I used to work at a place called King's Dominion in Richmond, Virginia. And King's Dominion was an amusement park, uh, and still is. And the ride I happened to work was called Wacky Wheels. It was one of the most popular rides at King's Dominion. And it was a very simple ride. I mean, you just get in this car with a lawnmower engine, you go around a track. I didn't think it was all much to it, but everyone loved this ride. And my job often was to work the gate. And when you work the gate, what you do is you measure people and make sure they're tall enough to get on the ride, and you keep order over the line. And it was a long line, a long queue that just, you know, corralled uh, quite extensively. And on those hot July Richmond days, people got pretty upset when people would cut in line. And once in a while, someone... Uh, would uh, a parent would, would get in line, come up, tap me on the shoulder, and say, see that kid? No, not that one. That kid, that kid, he cut in line. And convinced that I would do something about it, the parent's satisfied, goes back in line, and then what does that parent do? Oh, yes, they watch. Watch to see that justice will be done. Now, imagine you're that parent, that you've, you know, you've informed me about all this, and, and you've seen this, juvenile delinquent cut in line in front of you, but you've been waiting in the Richmond sun for an hour for this ride, and these kids think they can just slip in. And uh, imagine your reaction when you watch that kid come to the front of the line. I put my hand on his shoulder and say, son, welcome to King's Dominion. Enjoy the ride. You'd be, probably be pretty ticked, right? And maybe, maybe it's something like the way we feel when we read this passage in Luke about the thief on the cross, you see, the so-called thief on the cross. Because here's a guy, here's a guy who he sneaks in, doesn't he? He, he, he comes in, not just the 11th hour, the 11th hour in the 59th minute. And, and, you know, that can be a painful thing because, you know, some of us have been a Christian a long time. I've been Christian since I've been 18 and you know, not as long as some others here, but longer than some of you. But some of you have been a Christian as long as you can remember. And you've worked the nursery for years in your church, you see. You, you, you enter in that theological problem of, do I tithe as a grad student? You, you brought the donuts to grad chapel, and you continue to do so, and you serve the Lord. And, and you have to face the fact that here's a guy who's never brought the donuts to grad chapel, he never tithed from his student loan. He never did any of that. And what do you do with that? It just doesn't seem fair, does it? Well, I think this passage is a great reminder that it's not fair. The kingdom of God is not fair. And if we take seriously our understanding of grace, sola gratia, saved by grace, that that's really true, then it's not about us. If we are, since we are saved by grace alone, uh, it's about him, you see. And though what that also means is that we must rely on God to draw us, even in the process of salvation. So for the remainder of this morning, what I'd like to do is talk about what I see as the components of drawing closer to God. 
Uh, sometimes we see God doing his thing, and now it's our job to do our bit and draw closer to him. I don't see it like that. I don't think Luke sees it like that. But I do see God working in different aspects of the process of drawing us to God. Let me talk about some of those components. The first component is this. It's conviction, what I call conviction. Look with me. I hope you have your Bibles. Look with me at verse 39. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since we are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Here we have a situation where we have two men on either side of Jesus. One man who takes last moments of his life to upbraid the Christ, to mock him, to scorn him, to scorn the one, uh, only one who could save him from death. But there is something distinctly different about the other man. Because on the other side, is we find a man, rather than scorning the Christ, rebukes the first man and says, Who are you? Don't you know that we are getting what our deeds deserve? And I have to stop right in my tracks there uh, because th that is an astonishing statement. Uh, about a week ago, my wife and I were coming home from some friend's house, and, and we had spent the e a nice evening there with them, and we brought a salad, which wasn't quite eaten, and some other things, and we put the salad back in the, in the car, and it's, it's, it had, it's a vinegar salad, and I sure didn't want it to tip, you see, and we didn't have a very good stable way, so we just kind of had it in the back seat. And, and the other thing, I said to my wife, I said, Kim, do you, do you know where my wallet is? And she said, no. I said, oh, gosh, I didn't even bring it. Okay, well, so we get in the car, and uh, I'm driving down Hill Road, and there's a stop sign. I kind of stop because, you know, it's such a dark road. The stop sign just comes out at you. I stop, and the salad's, you know, tip. And, she, and so my wife said, why don't you just stop a little bit more softly next time? So I said, okay, good idea. So I come, we, we're driving out. We come to the next stop sign. And I didn't really stop. I, I kind of like rolled stopped, you know? And I, it, you know, I said, well, I kind of stopped. And so I'm driving by another 50 feet and I see a blue light in my rearview mirror. And, uh, and so, so uh, I, pu I pull over and I said, the one night I don't have my license, I get pulled over. And I, I pulled, I rolled down the window. And the officer, you know, says, so um, you realize that was a stop sign? I said, yes, I did, officer. I went right through it, didn't I? <laughs> and I said, you know, you have to give me what I deserve. And he actually said, well, do you have your license? And I said, funny you should ask. <laughs> and I said, I don't have my license either. He said, well, it happens. And he said, well, let me just get your name. And then he called us in. And he just said, let me off with a warning. And my wife couldn't believe it because she said, every time I get stopped, they write me up for a ticket, but you. So anyway, uh, here's the thing. is like when, when you do something, and you, it's one thing to roll through a stop sign and say, I'm getting what I, my deeds deserve. It is another thing, friends, to be crucified to a tree and saying, I'm getting my deeds, what my deeds deserve. Right? So what's he talking about here? I think he's talking about a, a few things. Uh, first of all, I think he's talking about his legal guilt. Traditionally, these two men on the cross are called thieves, but in reality, they probably weren't thieves at all. Romans didn't crucify petty thieves. They crucified terrorists, people who would try to subvert the order, perhaps by murdering or kidnapping or, or something of the sort. These men on the cross were not shoplifters. They were the analogy of the shoe bomber you see, of Osama bin Laden's. Uh, he was quite right. Uh, legally, this was the punishment that they deserved. He's speaking to his legal guilt. But I have to believe there's something else going on, that he's not just speaking to his legal, technical guilt. I think there's something else going on here when he says we are getting what our deeds deserve. I think he's talking about spiritual conviction. Jonathan Edwards sometimes makes the distinction between legal conviction and spiritual conviction. 
Legal conviction is you're sorry when you got caught. Spiritual conviction has to do with the fact that whether you've been caught or not, you have sinned against a holy God, and your behavior, the things you've thought, said, and done are an affront to the holiness of God. I think David speaks to this very clearly in Psalm 51. He says, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is wicked in your sight. But why would he say such a thing? Well, you, you might know the story. You see, one spring day, David's on the rooftop. He sees a bathing beauty in the distance, and being king, he gets what he wants pretty much. So he said, you bring her here. One thing leads to another. She's with child. He has arranges to have her husband killed. He thinks he's gotten away with it. Then Nathan the prophet comes in and, and tells Nate, uh, David a parable and tells this parable about a poor man, and all the poor man had was a little lamb. And a rich man came and took that lamb away. And David said, well, that man deserves to die. And Nathan says, David, you're the man. David had been found out. But he experiences a spiritual conviction, saying against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And friends, one thing that's true about grace is grace means that we have to be brought into a spiritual conviction. Because when we sin, there's a variety of ways we respond. One way we respond is simply by denial, right? You know, sin, what sin? And we push it out of the periphery of our vision. And part of us knows what we're doing. It's almost just, just the periphery of our vision, and we just don't want to think about it. We deny it. Another response to sin is deal-making. Oh, we're aware of it, you see, but, but we start making deals with God. We say, oh, God, it will never happen again. God, God I'll try harder this time. And, and we, we think that if we're sorry enough or if we repent hard enough, uh, God will be pleased with our repentance and he'll make a deal with us. But, but you see, uh, that's not what God's interested in. Uh, rather, he's not interested in denial. He's not interested in our deal making. He's interested in our dependence, knowing that there is absolutely nothing we can do to make up for our sin. We are completely dependent on the mercy and grace of God, not just to deliver us from the guilt of our sin, but to deliver us from the ongoing pollution and the stain of that sin. We can't do anything. We are, we are at God's feet, you see, friends. We are completely, utterly dependent on his grace, and we are saved by his grace. And we, when we get into denial, and when we get into deal-making with God, it just shows we don't believe we're saved by grace alone. But the truth of the gospel is that we are saved by grace alone, and so we're free from all that game playing. That's what it means when God brings conviction. Conviction that we can't do it, and we're saved by his grace. I think there's something else that God works when he works with us, and that's recognition. Recognition. Look with me at verse 41, if you would. We are punished justly, the man says, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. This, again, is a remarkable passage. The man says, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man here, this Jesus, has done nothing wrong. The thief, so-called thief, spoke more than he knew because it's true. Jesus did nothing wrong. In fact, the evangelist knows full well Jesus was without sin. I mean, think about it. Peter, Jesus' best friend, his closest buddy for three years, says he was a lamb without blemish or defect. And when I encountered Day by day, minute by minute with my sin, I have to fall down and worship the one who knew no sin. Jesus was without sin, but it is God who gives us that recognition. 
But there's something else that this man recognized, and that is this, is that Jesus was king. That can only be the case when he says, Jesus, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. He's calling him king. That, too, is simply by God's grace, that God had opened up his eyes to the fact that the man dying next to him was king. Now, the third thing the man recognizes is that Jesus' kingdom was a transcendent kingdom. The thief on the cross knew full well that Jesus was dying, right? But nevertheless, he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He knew that Jesus was king, not of an ordinary kingdom. This is no Herod. This is, this is no Caesar. This is a kingdom that will last and endure in a way that no other kingdom endures. Jesus was the transcendent king. The thief on the cross gets all this. And my question is, how? You see, where are all the other disciples? You know, they're hiding somewhere. They got their heads in their hands. They think it's over. And so here's a man who, as far as we know, hasn't seen any of Jesus' miracles, hasn't heard him speak, hasn't had minimal contact, if any, with him at all, and in the space of a couple hours comes to see things that the 12 haven't even yet seen. How does that work? And I think the only possible answer is that we just say, God, in his grace, revealed it to him. But I think we can also say that from a human point of view, something is going on, you see. Something is going on within the man. Because it's just typical of God that when he's about to work with grace in our life, he puts us in a position where our dreams seem to be collapsing. Because here's a man who was an insurrectionist, fighting for the cause of Israel, and where were his supporters now? Where were the ticker tape parades? Where were the songs about his body lying a smoldering in the grave? Oh, they, those supporters were nowhere to be found. Instead, people were shouting, free Barabbas! I don't care about him, just free Barabbas! This man wasn't Barabbas. This man felt anything. You see, he felt betrayed. He felt as if he had been chasing the wrong dream. You see. But it's precisely at the points where we've come disillusioned with our dreams that God is ready to work race. There's a story about an Indian tribe uh, in Australia called the Okipa Indians. Now, the Okipa Indians have a myth, have a story, uh, and that is, in the, according to this story, when the creator created heavens and earth. He separated the heavens from the earth with a gum tree. It's the gum tree that holds up the heavens and the earth. And in keeping with the myth, the Kipa Indians, who were nomads, uh, have this ritual where every morning the elders would raise up a gum tree pole, and if the gum tree pole would point this way, they'd say, okay, the food must be here. And if it pointed that way, they would go that way. And this is the way it went for years and years. Not very scientific, you might say, but it worked. It gave their lives orientation and meaning. And then tragedy happened. One day, as the elders were lifting up the gum tree pole, snap, it just broke. And they didn't know what to do. And after wandering around for a few days, the only thing they could think of doing was lying down and wait for the sky to collapse. Now, you see, we have our Okilpa trees, uh, or uh, gum tree poles too, don't we? We have things in our lives that give our lives meaning, orientation, direction, and it ain't necessarily the cross of Christ, if we're honest. It might be your grades. It might be your career. It might be your boyfriend or your or spouse or, or whatever it might be. We, you know, we have our gum tree poles. Those things in life that give our life meaning, but then what happens when you hear it creaking? When you hear it as if it might snap? You see, what God tries to do is get you to identify those things in life. And when you hear it creaking, that's when God wants to come in with his grace. That's when he wants you to recognize the true kingdom that lasts. 
and that's his kingdom. Third point, God not only works conviction and recognition, he also ultimately works petition. Verse 42. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. When you and I came to Christ, and I trust we all have, uh, it wasn't enough to be convicted of our sin. It wasn't enough to recognize that Jesus is Lord. We had to respond with a prayer. We had to say, Lord, I can't do this. Would you come into my life? I believe God works that prayer through us, that, that even that prayer is by the grace of God. But, what, but notice what happens, you see. Notice what Jesus says. Jesus answered him, and I says, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. Today. Notice Jesus doesn't say, well, well, first of all, you have to stop being a Democrat, you see. Or you have to stop being a Republican. Or you have to get baptized. Or you have to do this. Jesus says, with unconditionally today, you have to, you'll be with me in paradise. No if, ands, or buts. Today. You see, God is the God of today. And he says, this is going to happen today. And where's he going? Paradise. It's originally a Persian word. It means garden. Today, you go to the garden with me. We'll, sit on the, we'll do some bench time together in the garden. And what's he talking about? I think really the Garden of Eden, isn't it? It's the place where God is present. You're going to be present. When? Today. Imagine how the man must have responded. Imagine the pain he's in on the cross. And the only thing he sees is the gawking crowd. The only thing he hears is their taunts. The taste of blood probably in his mouth from eternal, eternal bleeding. His body's completely racked up pain. And yet, coursing over that painful reality, the stench of the garbage heap, there's the promise of Jesus. Today, you will be with him paradise. You see, God's today crowds out the pain of our life. And uh, that's what it means. That's what God does in response to petition. And we praise God for that, don't we? that this is promise for us today. But let's go back to King's Dominion to wrap up. You might say, hey, but is it fair? Is it fair? Well, in some ways, it depends, you see. You see, it depends, I think, whether you see King's Dominion as something in the pie and by and, and off and yonder, or whether you're in King's Dominion now, whether you're experiencing it now. It all depends on whether you're taking the ride with your Heavenly Father on a daily basis or whether that's just something that's not part of your experience. It, it, it depends, you see, whether you really believe that you're not just saved by grace when you made the decision, but you're being saved by grace day by day, hour by hour, moment by moment, in the here and now. See, grace isn't just something that God did. Grace is something he continues to pour into our lives and saves us by. It all depends, in other words, on whether you take Jesus at his word when he says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Thank you that it's so overwhelming we cannot even grasp it. Thank you that though we deserve wrath, you brought us life and abundant life and salvation, and you brought us into the garden. And one day, Lord, we will see that thief, and uh, we know that uh, he was where we are, and we are where he is. We are no different. And we share this in common, that we've experienced your grace, and it's all because of what you've done. Thank you, Lord, for this unspeakable gift. We pray that that might be an ever-present reality as we go on our way today and the remainder of our week till we meet again on the Lord's day. We pray this in Christ's name. Please rise for the uh, Lord's benediction. Let's... May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ.
the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be on you all.